podcast at some time, but but it will be YouTube video first. All right. Let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. All right, everybody. Welcome to this very special Scrum Master Toolbox podcast YouTube episode. Okay, the audio is also on the podcast uh, feed as you're probably listening to this on the podcast with uh, along with all the other 8,000 people who usually download one of the episodes. But uh, this is a very special episode. I have with me a friend, Ed, uh, who's actually going to have some critical questions for us that uh, many of you guys have uh, probably uh, asked yourselves or are being asked by your colleagues. So first, a quick intro. Ed is our uh, marketing uh, wizard here on uh, Oikosofia and the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. And we're actually doing a project together, the 48-hour book method. Uh, link is on the show notes and in the description if you guys want to check it out. But Ed, a uh, quick intro to you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um. Uh, well, I would like to see myself as a product manager of all the product ideas that I come across and all the products that we work together. So, um, and, and this is what I do most of the time, almost product manage everything uh, from managing my life to teaching people um, certain aspects of, let's say, product and marketing um, um, and, and that include authority building, basically. This is what all, our book is all about. And in that book, we are teaching how to use product management methodologies in managing your own, um, um, let's say, um, personal brand as a thought leader. So this is very rough of what I do. Absolutely. And uh, Ed's been working with us for a while. He's helped with launching some of our books and uh, uh, just recently helped also with uh, the first serious Facebook ad campaign for the Agile Online Summit. So it's like, a, this guy's a marketing wizard, but he had a question for us that has nothing to do with marketing. Uh, so uh, let's start with that and introduce that question for us. How did you come up with that question and why did you want to talk to me about it? Well, why do I want to talk to you about it is obvious because I cannot think of any better person uh, who I can, who I know or can reach out to who can answer this uh, as an authority in, the, in, in, in this area. And having worked in Agile while working with you for four and a half years, I thought that this would be a perfect time to dig in a little bit more details because my knowledge of Agile is very theoretical or uh, a little bit far off um, as I'm not an Agile practitioner, professional Agile practitioner, but I do work in product management. So it's one of the, uh, like I was going through uh, uh, certain job applications and I got uh, some interest in uh, from some companies and most of the companies that I'm um, interested or I like to, to work in, they also need um, a, a person to help them run Agile ceremonies. And I thought that like, okay, this is the perfect time for me to go on a refresher ride with Wasco, one and only, <laughs> on, uh, on the topic. And here we are. So what was the question that, this, uh, that started this, this episode and this conversation? So this is how to run Agile ceremonies. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a question I get all the time. Uh, many people, of course, mostly either managers who need to manage teams or scrum masters who are just starting their journey, they ask this question. But I, I wanted to really explore this a little bit further and actually go into the scrum guide. So um, as many of you know, that's written by Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, which are uh, two of the original creator of uh, something they called patterns that then together form Scrum. So actually, we're going to talk about the Scrum guide that describes the Scrum patterns. They call it the rules of the game. And actually, that's what it is. It's the rules for running a Scrum uh, delivery method or delivery process. Uh, of course, I'll add my own commentary to that but so that you guys know, I'll put the link on the show notes and in the description below. The Scrum guide is where uh, if you will, this is the authoritary source for you know what Scrum is. Now, the first question that uh, uh, 
and ask this, okay, so how do I run the Scrum and Agile ceremony? So uh, let's dive into that a little bit and uh, start with the Scrum Guide, which I have right here. Uh, hope you're seeing this on the screen. If you're not, the, the screen recording is on the YouTube channel. You can go there and, uh, of course, follow it. And it starts with, the, I mean, the Scrum Guide has many things. It's about uh, 13 pages, which I think is a, is a pretty good size for the definition of Scrum. And, and it talks about two things which we are going to explore. So the first one is the Scrum events. So first note, it, they're not called Scrum meetings. Uh, they're also not called Scrum ceremonies, although there are other authors who refer to them as ceremonies. They are called Scrum events. And there's a few, there's five here, as you can see, they're listed. The sprint, which is actually not an event, it's a container for the events. And then the sprint planning, daily scrum, sprint review, and sprint retrospective. We'll go through those. But as you can see, there's two key things here. First, the sprint, and we'll talk more about that. The sprint is one important concept in the scrum, and it's a time box, meaning it starts it and it ends at a pre-specified time. And then the Scrum Artifacts, because the events happen to include and revolve around the artifacts, which are the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. We'll talk about those first. Uh, or we'll talk about those later, but first, the Scrum event. So first thing is the sprint is a container for all other events. So the first thing we learned by looking at the Scrum Guide is that the sprint is not an event but it's a container. Everything happens within a sprint. And this is a very key insight to understand Scrum. It's all about what happens in one time box. It's not about how to run your company. It's not about how to run a multi-team project where some teams are not running Scrum. It is about how to run one team or a group of teams, if you take scaled Scrum approaches, that are working themselves on delivering increments, right? So if you have, let's say, a, a marketing team somewhere that is working in a different way, they're probably not using Sprint or Scrum, but the team that is developing the software is most likely using Sprint or Scrum. And the Sprint is the container. Everything happens in a Sprint. There's nothing happening outside the Sprint. And this is an important concept. How we're doing so far, Ed? Yeah, I love it. Uh, I think this is a fresh way to look at it. I never looked at it as a container, so it does help. Absolutely. All right. So each event, and this is important, it's written as the second phrase in the description, sorry, the description of Scrum events. Each event in Scrum is a formal, meaning there are other ways, but this is these are formal opportunities to inspect and adapt. Now, the Scrum Guide says inspect and adapt Scrum artifacts. I would say that is a failure of the authors. It's inspect and adapt, period. There's no need to add adapt Scrum artifacts. Of course, we're going to do that, but that's not the core. The core is to inspect and adapt. And inspection and adaption is not in any way limited to the artifacts. So that's a very important commentary from my side. I think the authors clearly failed by adding these last three words. Ed, you had a question. What is artifacts? Yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second, uh, but let me tell you what the artifacts are, just so that people know. The artifacts are the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. And, and we'll talk more about what that means in a second. All right, so this is an important thing. It's not adapt Scrum artifacts, although that's true. It's adapt, inspect and adapt, period. So the failure to operate any events as prescribed results in lost opportunities to inspect and adapt. And here you can see that they've taken the artifacts away because it's not about artifacts. It's about us as a team working together to learn. And this is like, this is a key part. Learn to play the game better. And I want to emphasize this play the game better because actually what we're talking about Scrum was inspired by a very old article called The New New Product Development Game by Takeuchi and Nonaka. And they called it the game. Literally, that's what they called it. And that's where they use the first Scrum metaphor. In fact, the authors, Takeuchi and Nonaka, actually uh, likened 
the uh, efforts that a product development team does to a scrum team trying to move the ball up the field. And that's where Scrum, the name, comes from, right? Then Jeff and, and uh, Ken and, and Mike and others uh, called this particular method the Scrum method or the Scrum framework, as they call it. But the, the idea is that it really is like a team trying to learn to play the game better. That's what you need to think about. When you think about Scrum, the, the, each sprint is like a, a, a game. Right? It starts and it ends. It has very clear boundaries and boundaries are extremely important in terms of self-improvement. And we learn to play the game better. That's what the sprint is all about, right? It's one game, we learn, we play, we inspect and adapt, we learn, we play it again, we inspect and adapt, we learn, we play it again. So that's a very important aspect. Yeah, the, the term game here, I think the, the term scrum here came from rugby, if I'm not wrong, is it? Yeah, correct. Yeah. It comes from rugby. And uh, scrum is when all the players get together and they are uh, trying to set up a move, right? They are all together. One of the teams has the ball and they have to set up a move, right? That's what that, that uh, image is, the scrum. And of course, that's what product development uh, teams do, right? They come together and they set up the next move, right? So it came from there, but but actually the new new product development game paper was the first one to refer to um, uh, product development as rugby, and right. that's where the Scrum word comes from. Okay. All right. So now we know what the Scrum events are and what the Sprint is. So Sprint is a container, and each event is an opportunity to inspect and adapt and take the artifacts away, please. Uh, then we have sprint planning. This is the first event we're going to cover. Uh, sprint planning is what starts the sprint. And it, it starts it by laying out the work to be performed. And it's almost, it, this is really like a scrum team, um, a rugby team. They, they get together in the scrum and they uh, agree on what the play is, right? And then they set it up. That's what they do. And that's what we do in product development. In sprint planning, we get the whole team together. We talk about where we need to move the ball next and we set it up. We lay out the work that needs to be performed for the sprint. It goes a bit further than that. I'll, I'll go into that in a, little, in a little bit. So key roles, product owner, right? Sprint planning, the product owner needs to be there. Product owner is a, a role that embodies the idea of driving the product forward. They have the vision, they have the direction, they help the team figure out and clarify that what that direction is. And of course, in sprint planning, they also tell the team, this is what I expect. Do you understand it? How can we achieve it? They tackle any dependencies. They might have any obstacles together with the team. And, and then they select the work. So the product backlog items, they select the work they're going to take into the sprint. That's what the sprint planning does. Uh, an important addition in this year's Scrum Guide, this is 2020 Scrum Guide, the Scrum team may also invite other people to attend sprint planning to provide advice. This is very important because uh, some scrum masters tend to think that sprint planning is something that happens only with the team and the product owner. Well, that's not true. We bring in as many and the right people in order to help the team lay out the work to be performed for the sprint. And of course, we know that what we need to achieve. And that's actually done using uh, something they don't call an artifact here. They call a commitment, I believe, which is the sprint goal right? We're going to do this, this sprint, right? So this sprint, our goal is to allow people to register through their mobile phone. And then whatever items we take into the sprint backlog, they have to allow us to allow people to register through the mobile phone, right? So that's an example of uh, um, what a sprint goal could look like. All right, questions about sprint planning yet? Nope, I think I'm fine with this. All right, cool. So next we go into the daily scrum. So daily scrum, uh, as you can see, is the only event that doesn't have sprint in it because it happens daily, right? It has daily in it. So that's a very important aspect. Now, there, there are some people that say, you know, 
maybe we could run this, the daily scrum every other day, like three times a week or two times a week. Well, you're missing the whole point. The daily scrum is a pattern. Think back to a moment when something urgent was happening, a crisis. What happens? People get together and they talk about the problem every day. It's a pattern that emerges. So if that works in urgent and or emergent emergency situations, it definitely works every day. So daily scrum is to inspect progress towards the sprint goal, inspect and adapt. And so they say adapt the sprint backlog as necessary. We don't just adapt the sprint backlog. We, we might do a quick change of, you know, who's on what position, right? We might say, hey, uh, Ed, uh, for, for today, we actually don't need you to create the Facebook uh, campaign. We actually need you to work with a designer to generate the graphics we need for the book launch, which is not Facebook uh, uh, campaign, but you know the book launch is coming up and the designer is lost and we need somebody to sit with, with the designer to get that done, right? That, that would be an adaptation. This is no change to the sprint backlog. It's just a change to who does what. Right, so I think here the authors again uh, uh, missed the opportunity to talk about inspecting and adapting as a holistic understanding of how to reach our goal, which is of course the sprint goal. They do talk about adjusting the upcoming planned work. Uh, I think that this is probably a, 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 the idea that you know there's a plan for the sprint. Advanced teams don't use that kind of plans. They they don't you know, set everything up in, in detail up front. So there's something that maybe this is important for beginner teams. But but the key thing here is inspect the progress towards the sprint goal and adapt everything, adapt everything. Who does what? Technologies. Uh, do we escalate? Do we call somebody in? Like adapt everything in order to reach that sprint goal. Uh, if I would, uh, so sprint goal is like the definition of success for the sprint right? It, it's the goal, right? If we're talking about football, you have to score a goal. Or for American friends, that's soccer, right? You have to score the goal. And every single day we work to score. That's what the daily scrum is about. And that's what we should be asking. What's preventing us from scoring, right? From reaching the sprint goal. That's the key question. And adapt anything you need to. Any questions so far, Ed? Yeah, cool. Um, so I still have something the... about the daily scrum, though, so we should okay, go through carry that. Okay, carry on. Maybe I'll put up my question after this. All right, cool. So then the daily scrum is a 15-minute event. Again, this is part of the pattern, right? We've all been in meetings that, you know, just they just go on forever and they never end. That's not what the daily scrum is about. It's about getting together, huddling up, deciding what to do, and moving on. That's what the key is here. And uh, again, the last the comment that I want. There, yeah, sure. Why, why it says developer teams of the Scrum, developers of the Scrum team? Yeah, I think, so that's a very good question, Ed. So the Scrum guide says the daily Scrum is a 15 minute event for the developers uh, of the Scrum team. I don't agree with that. I think this is totally wrong. The 15 minute event is for whoever is necessary. Now, most of the time it will be the designers, the developers, the testers that are working together every day, right? Yeah. But I would I mean, never have a daily scrum without the product owner, right? The product owner is constantly gathering feedback from customers, stakeholders, and they should bring that feedback into the daily scrum. So yeah. uh, I would say it the daily scrum is a 15 minute event to help the team reach the sprint goal period and now it can mean anything it can mean that it's only the developers it can mean that it's the developers and the product owner it can mean anything now the authors do say that if the product owner or scrum master are actively working on items in the sprint backlog they participate as developers and i think this is a big failure from the part of the authors the product owner and scrum master are always part of the team even if they are not working on items in the sprint backlog so I, I would just remove this last part here and say that it's for the Scrum team. And the Scrum team is uh, composed of the what they call developers in the Scrum Guide. So that's testers, designers, uh, coders, programmers, uh, but also the product owner 
and the Scrum Master. They are part of the team. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And this resonates very well with my uh, experience in my last role as a senior product manager. Um, to me, it makes no sense to just get developers on the team where they are not the only ones who are making the product. <laughs> Absolutely. So daily scrums are there to improve communication, identify impediments. And this is, for me, the most important. Promote quick decision-making and consequently eliminate the need for other meetings. Now, I, I've worked with clients where they say, oh, we have too many meetings. Could we stop the daily scrum? And I'm like, the reason why you have too many meetings is because you're not having the daily scrum. Ideally, and this is not always possible, especially in functional organizations where the teams are split up, but in cross-functional organizations where all the roles are in one team, the daily scrum is all you need. And if you're all in the same room, like this year is 2020, it's a corona year, nobody's in the same room, right? But if you were in the same room, you probably don't even need to have a formal 15-minute event the Scrum Master just needs to make sure that the team is talking all the day. A, you know, Every time a, a topic comes up, talking all the day to make sure that they are collaborating. Because the goal, the real reason for the daily Scrum is to amplify to 10x the collaboration between the team members. And that, they say that, you know, in the Scrum Guide, the last part is, you know, they, they can meet throughout the day. They don't need to uh, meet only in the daily Scrum. Uh, for teams starting up, I would say always do the daily Scrum. Don't even argue with it. Just do it. Learn to do it well and then move on. But always start with it. For teams that are already working very well, uh, they might just skip the daily Scrum. They might have daily Scrum on, on a, you know, their, their own messaging platform like Slack or or, or WhatsApp, whatever. Uh, but the idea is that uh, it's about communicating, it's about generating collaboration opportunities and taking up advantage of those collaboration opportunities. Now, you see this in sports teams all the time. Like as the game goes on, they are talking to each other. They are constantly inspecting and adapting, changing positions slightly, giving advice to each other, explaining what their intention is so that they can play better the game. And it is quite... Um, a great uh, metaphor for us as, as product development teams because that's what we're doing, right? We're moving the ball forward towards the sprint goal. And in doing so, we need to constantly adjust our collaboration strategy. Perfect. Did you have more questions on the daily scrum? I don't have a, a question specific to daily scrum and I'm going to hold this question that I have till the end. If we All right, can cool. More time. Then we have sprint review. Sprint review... Uh, I, I like to call it demo because, in my opinion, it is a review, so the name is correct. But I like to emphasize the aspect that we are demonstrating what we have delivered. So I like to call it the sprint demo. Uh, some people call it demo and review. Uh, in the guide, they call it sprint review. The purpose of the sprint review is to inspect the outcome deliverable of the sprint and determine, uh, determine future adaptations. During the event, the Scrum team and stakeholders, this is important, who are your stakeholders? Do you know who they are? Anyone that is, uh, can directly or indirectly affect product decisions should be included in the review. Uh, so the Scrum team and the stakeholders review what was accomplished in the sprint and what has changed in their environment. Because, you know, as you develop more, you learn more, and that might mean that you need to change certain things. So this is a very important aspect. And again, highlights the idea of inspecting and adapting. Inspecting and adapting is the kernel of Scrum. And, and people need to understand this, that if you're not inspecting and adapting, if you're just, quote unquote, doing the work, you're not doing Scrum, even if you're hosting those events. Inspect and adapt. That's a key here. So the sprint review is the second to last event of the sprint, and it is time box to a maximum of four hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. I usually have my sprint reviews at about one hour or less, and I try to set them up, facilitate them so that we can quickly go through the demo and then jump into conversation. And this is very important because you show what you have done, 
you allow the stakeholders to play with the product and give you their feedback, but then you need to be um, deliberate about learning from that, right? So demonstrating the product is is a is a learning. It's a uh, an introspective, retrospective opportunity. But we need to do something with it, and that's why I try to set up the review so that we we demonstrate the product, and then we quickly go into reflection and improvement mode. Does it happen on the last day of of the sprint or after the sprint? That's a very good question. So if you're going to schedule them, you schedule them. <clears throat> the last day of the sprint obviously don't make it a friday afternoon because that's stupid because people just want to go home if you're going to do it on a friday do it on a friday morning because then people still have a, a bunch of hours and they're not in a hurry to get out of the sprint review i typically would like to start my sprints in the middle of the week because uh that helps to break off the uh, uh inevitable rush and um uh perhaps uh hastiness when it happens on a Friday, but I mean, you can also do it so that you start the sprint on a Friday and you end it on a Thursday. And that helps also because we're not in a hurry on a Thursday. And on a Friday, we kind of set the stage, uh, set the stage for the next sprint. And then people have a relaxing two days and then they come back re-energized. But you know, you need to find what works for your team. All teams are different. But I would, if I'm going to schedule it, I would schedule it at the end, the, the last day of the sprint at the start of the day. And uh, I would emphasize the need to do many micro reviews and demos throughout the sprint, right? You don't want to wait to the end of the sprint to find out that something you did was wrong. So I try to generate as many opportunities as possible to at least have the team and the product owner together review what they've delivered so that they can inspect and adapt, again, the core of Scrum much more often. Right. All right, and next is the last event on the list. It's the sprint retrospective. And this is the event that if I would have to say one that must always happen, this is the one, right? If you just have, here's the thing. If you just have a time box, that's the sprint, the container, nothing else. If you just have a time box and a retrospective at the end of that time box, you can't avoid developing Scrum as a whole set of patterns because you are learning, right? That's the purpose of the sprint retrospective is to learn how we improve the way we play the game. Now, the, the way the authors phrased it is that the purpose of the retrospective is to plan ways to increase quality and effectiveness. That's true, but it's not even nearly enough. It's not even 5% of what we need to do, right? So here's the thing. Scrum is there to improve your business. Increased quality and effectiveness are important. Some say maybe critical, but they're not enough. We might need to change strategy. That should be in the retrospective. We might need to change the team setup. That should be in the retrospective. We might need to change even the business area we are working on. That should be in the retrospective. So. Uh, the Scrum Guide looks at product development teams as purely product development teams. I look at Scrum as a business growth process. And from that perspective, it's not about the product only. It's about everything else. And for me, the retrospective is very important in helping the team get out of their little corner, which they are in the whole sprint because they're focused, right? The whole sprint, they're focused on their little corner which is deliver an increment of the product. But that's not what we're doing. The game is not deliver the next increment. The game is improve the business with the next increment. All right, so the Scrum team inspects how the last sprint went with regards to individuals, interactions, processes, tools, and their definition of done. Definition of done is the first time we're talking about it. This is very important. Definition of done is what we say we are committing to as the minimum quality level. And this is important. Definition of done is the minimum quality level. It's not the maximum. It's the minimum quality level. In other words, it's the bar. It's what says if our you know, delivery is ready to be considered done or if there's still work to do, which then needs to be translated potentially into new sprint backlog items that go on to the next sprint. 
So the sprint retrospective concludes the sprint. It is time boxed to a maximum of three hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. We have a, a retrospective masterclass on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast website. Um, the, the key thing though, is that retrospective, the sprint retrospective is definitely done at the end of the sprint. Uh, I, I would keep it there. I, I would not make it three hours, even for a one month sprint. I would find opportunities to run micro retrospectives you know, regularly, like every day, whatever that is. Like, just ask a question. Hey guys, how did you guys think that meeting with um, Team Shark went yesterday? That's a retrospective moment. So for me, the role of the Scrum Master is to enable these retrospective moments throughout the sprint. Still having the retrospective at the end, but definitely not waiting to the end, especially in a one month sprint. Uh, I, it's it's still you know mind boggling to me why we still have the one month sprint as the standard for Scrum. It's totally out of date. I think many of the teams are now in two week sprints. Certainly, many of the teams I work with are in two week sprints, and I always advise, especially the more mature teams, to go to shorter sprints. Right, one week as an example. All right. So those were the events. That's the the question you asked first, right? How do we run the Scrum and Agile meetings? But I'm sure you have other questions about how to run those meetings. Yeah, so a couple of them. Um, the first one when you were explaining the the last part was uh, about how long, what is the maximum duration a Scrum or a Sprint, sprint could go? go for so i know base camp for example works for six week long sprints uh, on a personal level when i work on my project sometimes one or two weeks i, I work on uh, but when deciding the length of like okay this sprint has to be two weeks is it more like a framework okay we can do whatever we can in this given time or is it more like based on the project oh this project would need three weeks four weeks five weeks how does it work yeah, so Basecamp is a terribly bad example because they are a very mature team and they got to where they are after doing many experiments. So I would say that never consider that as a great example for a team that is starting up. And in fact, I would say that teams that are learning need more quick feedback. They don't need less quick feedback. They need more quick feedback. Now, Basecamp has found ways to get that feedback much faster. Even every day, they're getting feedback. They're releasing new stuff every day. And if you follow their blog, you see that they are much faster than releasing a new product increment every six weeks. But what they are doing is they're doing a lot of marketing buzz around the six-week mark. And that's okay. You can do that. But the team developing the product cannot work on six-week cycles. That would be stupid, right? That's why many teams do daily deliveries to production to learn, to get feedback. They do beta cycles so that they can go through the delivery and customer feedback much faster than they do the final release to the to production or to um beta is also production, but you know, to the final market. So uh, I would say if I would give an advice to any team getting started, I would say start with two weeks. And where do you find pain? Ask what's making this painful. And instead of avoiding the pain, ask yourselves, how could we do more of this so that we cannot help but improve, right? Uh, when daily scrums are painful, people typically reduce the frequency of the daily scrums. They go to two times a week or three times a week. That's, that's for me, the opposite of what we should do. If the daily scrum is painful, it's for a reason. So figure out why and improve that. And maybe you need to do two daily scrums a day so that you start to learn to understand what's missing here in order for us to benefit from what should be a collaboration enhancement event in the whole scrum setup what's the difference between a design sprint and a scrum sprint uh, it's a <clears throat> yeah very good point uh, design sprints are a result of us not having small enough teams and having different departments working with different mindsets. Design sprint, as Google defines it, is a different thing. 
design sprint as Google defines it is about the whole team working to get something out very, very quickly, but without committing to that as being the final version of the product, right? It's about learning something very quick. But very often what I hear, what I hear when people say design sprint, they also say requirements sprint, uh, they say planning sprint, uh, some, some people call it sprint zero. This is like me starting a baseball game and then saying, nah, I think four bases are too little. Let's make this more exciting. Let's play with five bases. No, we, we don't really need that many outfield players. Why don't we just have one outfield player that runs all around and tries to catch the ball when the ball goes to the outfield? Like that, you know, we tried Scrum, but we didn't really like it. That's a, a blog post by uh, Michael Feathers that, that sorry, by Ron Jeffries, that actually illustrates how ridiculous it is to use Scrum and then not do Scrum, right? We'll, we'll use all the Scrum words, but we're not actually playing Scrum. Like that's ridiculous. You can't like get the 3D better. Chess. <laughs> yeah, three like D chess, like three levels of chess board, but it's not chess anymore. But we call it chess. <laughs> so I would say let's focus on first following the rules, then learning what works and amplifying that, learning what doesn't work, and working around that. You know, constantly getting better. Okay. So can scrums exist without sprints? No, if you don't have a sprint, it's not Scrum anymore. Uh, one of the core aspects of Scrum is that it is a collection of patterns that worked well in the real world. Some teams benefited from those patterns, then some people collected a minimum list of patterns, put it together in the form of Scrum. So if, you don't, if you're not having sprints, it's not Scrum. It's something so, else. It might still be good for you. It's just not Scrum. So if the companies choose to incorporate these rituals, meetings in their regular, just the way they are, they may be making use of those meetings. They may be making benefit out of those, but they're not Scrum at all. Yeah, you can improve in many ways, uh, right? But, but having a daily Scrum when you're not having sprints, time boxes, retrospectives, you don't have a product owner, you don't have a product backlog, that's not Scrum. I mean. You yeah. could call that a daily meeting, of course. Uh, you could even call it daily scrum. It's just not a scrum. Yeah, okay. Cool. So I think we can move on. All right. So uh, I'm just going to do a, a quick review of the scrum artifacts. This, I think this is important. It's not too big. So I'm just going to go quickly through this. They say um, scrum artifacts represent work or value. Uh, this is true, although I would try to focus on value. Uh, the product backlog, each artifact contains a commitment. For the product backlog, it's the product goal. So the product goal is what the team commits to try to achieve. The sprint backlog is the sprint goal. So every sprint, we try to achieve the sprint goal through the execution of the items in the sprint backlog. And then for the increment, which is a delivery, right? An increment is, is an incremental delivery of the product we are creating. The commitment is the definition of done. As, as I said before, that's the minimum quality bar that we commit to adhere to before we say the work is done. So the product backlog is emergent. So it you know grows and evolves all the time, but also an ordered list. This is very important. Ordered list. Priority is critical in a product backlog because otherwise we start too many things and we don't finish enough. Right, So this is a very important, emergent and ordered. But this is the most important for me. For a Scrum team, the single source of work is the product backlog. In other words, if it's not on the backlog, it's not going to get done. Uh, CEO calls you in the middle of the night and asks you, hey, could you do that for me for tomorrow? You go back to the CEO and says, absolutely. Just talk to the product owner, make sure it's in the product backlog, and we can take it up in the next sprint, right? So product backlog is a key aspect that also defines the contracts with stakeholders, right? What do we promise to do? We promise to work on the product backlog. We also promise not to do anything else so that we don't get distracted. We don't get you know turned away from the priorities the ordered list that the product owner has defined. Right? And, and you can imagine uh, how chaotic it would be 
if everyone on the team would just take work from anywhere else, like, you know, important people and important stakeholders, but they would just take work from anywhere else. And then the team members would go like, hey, wait a minute, Ed, we agreed we would create the Facebook campaign today. Why, why aren't you working on it? And then you say, well, it's because I decided, wait a minute, you decided who's the product owner? <laughs> See, so it's very important to follow the product backlog. All right, uh, there's a, an aspect which is not yet in the Scrum Guide, but I do do that with my teams. Um, a product backlog includes items, that's a product backlog items, that can be done by the Scrum team within one sprint. And here's the key, they are deemed ready to go into the sprint before they get into the sprint. So this ready part is very important. It, we call it the definition of ready. It emerged because many items were getting into sprint planning, but they were not ready. They were unclear. They were too fuzzy. There was no clear definition of acceptance criteria. And that's a bad thing because the team gets lost and they lose time trying to figure that out during the sprint. So many teams that I work with have what they call a definition of ready or DOR that each product backlog item needs to meet before it gets accepted into the sprint. The commitment for the product backlog is the product goal. Then we have the sprint backlog and the sprint backlog has two parts. It's the sprint uh, uh, goal and the product backlog items that the team has defined they will work on. Now, the author says an actionable plan for delivering the increment. That's not part of the sprint backlog. That's just how we agree to go about delivering the what. So I, I'd say that this is not part of your sprint backlog, but it is an agreement you make during the sprint planning. So sprint backlog should have the why and the what. So the sprint goal, why it's important, and the what, what are the items. Sprint goal for me is the most important aspect of sprint planning. I always start sprint planning with the sprint goal. And if we run out of time, I would rather have the sprint goal than the list of backlog items we are going to take because I trust the team and the product owner will work together to decide which items make sense to reach that goal. So I would focus on the why first. And then finally, we have the increment. Uh, an increment is a concrete stepping stone toward the product goal. That's how they defined it. Basically, it's a new version of the product or a new feature added to the product, whatever that is. It's an increment of value added to the product that gets us closer to the sprint goal. And they add something here that I think is very important. The sprint review should never be considered the gate. So scrum teams are encouraged to release every day, to deliver uh, product increments every day. So the sprint review is about learning, inspecting and adapting. It's not about creating a gate for releasing. If you need a gate, that's a different problem. Handle it somewhere else. Don't wait until the end of the sprint. If you have something ready mid sprint, you should deliver that, right? So that's a very important um, aspect. And uh, work cannot be considered part of an increment unless it meets the definition of done and this is very important that's the commitment of the increment we've already talked about it uh, they say and maybe this is the last thing i want to highlight here the definition of done creates transparency by providing everyone a shared understanding of what work was completed about as part of the increment this transparency means that if something was done, quote unquote, but did not meet the definition of done, it's considered in progress. It is not moved to the done column. You know, I've done everything I can. Great. But there are other people who need to contribute. So this item isn't done. Right. So it's, that's a very important aspect. Right. So that was my last comment on the uh, scrum, uh, agile meet scrum and agile meetings, but you had other questions. Uh, I, perhaps I want to just go through this question here before uh, that. Okay, sure. Um, Let's go back. what happens if a scrum is finished and the goal is not met? Does it goes to another scrum or you just rush on to finish it off and then start another scrum? Yeah, that's a very good question. If the sprint goal is not met, we need to learn why. So you do the review, 
you are clear and transparent towards the stakeholders. We did not reach this goal, but maybe you reached other goals that were not even described first, but we didn't reach this goal. We need to learn from it. Then in the retrospective, you analyze that, you make changes to the way you work so that next sprint, you're more likely to reach the sprint goal. And then you start the new sprint from scratch. Uh, the way I usually phrase it is, everything needs to earn the right to be on the sprint backlog in the sprint planning event. Everything. We don't work on stuff just because we failed to deliver it last sprint, so we kind of carry it over, right? That, that We call that spillage. And that's not really a good thing. So we need to learn why did that happen? How can we make it better? Now, in most cases, it's probably small things that need to be finished. You finish it in the next sprint and that's okay. But in some cases, it might be that it's just the wrong thing to do to take on that item and move it to the next sprint. We might want to drop it completely because we learned something significant that changes the priorities. So we don't want to work on that. So everything in my mind needs to earn its right to go on to the next sprint during the sprint planning event. So sprint planning, does it happen before the sprint start or at the beginning of the sprint? So that's an important question. Some tools need you to answer that question. But we don't need, we people don't need to answer that question. You can have sprint planning the day before the sprint starts. You can have sprint planning the day when the sprint starts. You can have a uh, one hour break between the last retrospective and the next sprint planning. You can have a half a day break between the last retrospective and the next sprint planning. It doesn't really matter, but it is the beginning of the commitment. So it's only after sprint planning that we actually are committing to what we want to do. Right? What if so, it takes too much time? I mean, the sprint started and you do it after the sprint started and you found out that one day is gone and you're still in the planning phase. Yeah, and that happens. And teams do go through that. Uh, that's an anti-pattern, right? That's a bad thing because what are you going to do if the sprint started and there's no sprint plan, there's no sprint goal and no selected backlog items? Like, what are you going to do? You're going to work on random stuff? Right. So some teams do have what they call learning uh, or improvement time. Uh, I know that SAFE has a whole sprint for that, which is more like a buffer. Uh, but but if you're going to do that, like if you're going to give time to the team to do stuff they want to work on without any you know concern of uh, uh, does it you know meet the sprint goal or not, then just give them that time explicitly and say that we have a break between the beginning, the end of the previous sprint and the beginning of the next. And you can do whatever you think is necessary in that break, right? It could be half a day or, or even a day, it doesn't matter. But the sprint only starts when we have a clear sprint goal and that's defined in the sprint planning. Cool. All right, then final question is, how is Agile different from Scrum? Uh, this is a very important question. Many people ask this question. Uh, let me just say that Scrum is a framework. I would call it a method, but uh, some people call it a framework and the creators call it a framework. Okay, so Scrum is a framework that fits the Agile values and principles. Agile is, if you will, the philosophy behind the creation of methods like Scrum, like extreme programming, uh, like feature-driven development. That was one of the old uh, Agile methods. Agile was kind of a collective name for what we called at that time lightweight methodologies as opposed to the waterfall heavyweight methodologies, right? So in that context, Scrum is just a lightweight methodology so that means Scrum is an Agile methodology, but Agile is the philosophy behind, right? And Scrum is kind of an instantiation, an example of what it would look like to create a, a, an Agile method. Can you think of any alternative of Scrum, like which is the competitor of Scrum or a challenger of Scrum? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in the Agile community, clearly Kanban is the, the most used alternative. Uh, Kanban is... Uh, quite different in that it does not have time boxes. Uh, so it uses a different perspective, a different paradigm in order to manage the work. 
but it also has themes, it also has reflection, it, has, it also has uh, demos and reviews, it's also about inspecting and adapting, so there's a lot of the, the things that are in Scrum, but it's a different method. But for me, my favorite is extreme programming. Extreme programming was one of the initial low, um, sorry, lightweight methodologies. And it, it started from the software world, but it has many of the practices that many scrum teams will need to apply as they learn to play the game better. Those practices are, are already defined in uh, extreme programming. Uh, so a couple of examples test-driven development or the creation of unit tests to validate that our software keeps on working as we wanted it to. Uh, there's also customer in the room, meaning that uh, in, in Scrum calls it the product owner, but it's somebody who knows what the product should look like and gives us constant feedback so that we may improve all the time. Like there's many practices that Scrum teams will eventually adopt that actually uh, were defined in extreme programming explained by Kent Beck. Yeah. Cool. I got the idea. Uh, one last question. Um, there was something that you were mentioning in the first part of uh, our discussion today. Uh, and I think that it's very, very important, and especially for someone who, uh, someone like me, who's not having extensive experience of going through many, many, many teams as an insider. So uh, th that, that is the difference between functional and cross-functional. I would love to for you to go in a little bit detail on the on the the differences uh, on on functional and cross-functional. Yeah, teams. that's a very important point. So functional, it's like this: it's waterfall. Period. Think about it this way: if you divide your teams into the design team, the programming team, the testing team, and they work separately then necessarily you will have to first create the design. When that is ready, you give it over to the programmers who then create the product. And then you give it over to the testers who then test the product. And that's what the waterfall looks like, right? So that's what functional is. Now, cross-functional means that instead of having all the designers in one team, all the programmers in one team, and all the testers in one team, you have teams that comprise those three roles and then you work together all the time, incrementing the product as you go, like Scrum describes. And uh, there's no need to hand over, this is a very important word, hand over something to the other, right? Because we know that when the developer and the uh, tester and the designer work well together, like work every day together, they find problems much faster, they resolve problems much faster, and the quality is overall higher. So that's what a cross-functional team would look like and there's a spectrum right there's not you know fully cross-functional uh, fully functional so for example you might have designers testers and programmers in one team and then you might have finance and marketing in another team that's both cross-functional at the creation of the product level but also it is functional in the sense that some parts of the delivery chain like marketing and sales are outside the team right so it, very simply, the harder the challenge, the more towards the cross-functional side of the spectrum you should go. The easier the challenge, the more you can, although I don't think you should, but the more you can be on the functional side. So you can afford the inefficiencies of a functional organization when the problem you need to solve is very simple. But when the problem you need to solve is very complex, you cannot afford the inefficiencies of a functional organization. So you need to move closer to the functional or to the cross-functional organization. Cool. Yeah, clear. All right. So I hope this was useful to you, Ed, and also to our listeners. This was just a, a short review of what the Scrum Guide says about those questions. So thank you very much for asking the questions, Ed, though. This was brilliant. Awesome. Awesome. I, I definitely enjoyed it. It was amazing refresher and thinking of it from your perspective. Um, I mean, I've read the books. I've done some, like in my previous uh, role, some of it because we haven't um, been uh, religiously sticking with the process, but uh, it's bringing in the, the whole picture together very well here. All right. Thank you, Ed. Thanks.